This year marks the 40th anniversary of the historic commitment made by the United States and China to establish formal relations, an act that has greatly benefited not just both countries, but the entire world. The National Committee on U.S.-China Relations was at the forefront of the Sino-American relationship even before that. Since 1966, educating citizens of both countries, bringing people together, and helping leaders to make better informed decisions. From athletes, university presidents, and urban planners, to journalists, government leaders, and Supreme Court justices, the National Committee's thousand-plus exchanges and programs have had a profound effect on tens of thousands of American and Chinese participants. When Premier Deng Xiaoping came to the United States in 1979, the National Committee co-hosted his only major foreign policy address and has done so for every visiting senior Chinese leader since then, including President Xi Jinping. The National Committee continues to address the relationship's most challenging issues in a variety of ways, among them, seven Track 2 dialogues convene, leading experts on topics such as security, economic relations, and healthcare. Professional fellowships help NGO leaders from China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States develop innovative practices. Forums and study tours bring together accomplished next-generation leaders from both sides of the Pacific. And briefings and visits to China enable members of Congress and military leaders gain informed perspectives. Through the decades, the greatest impact of the National Committee has been on people. Relations between governments rise and fall with the issues of the day, but personal bonds between individuals are the bedrock of constructive relations. The connections among those who have participated in National Committee exchanges and programs form a resilient and durable foundation for understanding respect, and cooperation. The past 40 years have shown the unprecedented progress and prosperity that cooperation can bring, though not without bumps along the way. Today, our world faces perils and challenges of growing complexity. These can only be resolved if our two countries harness their enormous potential by working together in an environment of peace and cooperation for the benefit of both peoples and of the global community. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, Mr. Stephen Orlins. Secretary Kissinger, Chairman Dalio, Ambassadors, Senators, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> Diplomats, friends, thank you so much for, for joining us at this critical time in U.S.-China relations. It's hard to believe that only two and a half years ago, President Xi stood in the beautiful Florida sunshine at Mar-a-Lago and said, For those who don't speak Chinese, a sound U.S.-China relationship, President Xi said, will benefit not only the two countries and their peoples, but also the world at large. We have a thousand reasons to get U.S.-China relations right, and not one reason to get it wrong. President Xi is clearly right, yet despite his apparent positive relationship with President Trump, we are seeing policies and narratives on both sides of the Pacific that are challenging the relationship that I have been working on for 42 years. On the U.S. side, we've seen tariffs imposed 
based on the economic fallacy that bilateral trade deficits matter. We've seen overly broad restrictions on Chinese investment and investigations of people of Chinese descent. We've seen limitations on Chinese students coming to the United States that hurt America's ability to attract top talent in the world. We have even seen threats to limit Chinese companies' ability to list in the United States. I could go on because, sadly, the list is very long. But we need time for others to speak tonight. On the Chinese side, we've seen continued discrimination against U.S. businesses, militarization of islands in the South China Sea, claims that the U.S. is the black hand behind the Hong Kong demonstrations, and human rights violations that challenge global norms. I could go on here, too. While some special interests in the United States and China benefit from these policies, the people of America and the people of China are suffering as a result of these policies. If we continue down this road, our children and grandchildren will live in a less secure and prosperous America and the world. The relationship at times seems very dark. So I'm often uplifted by the words of one of my heroes of my youth, Dr. Martin Luther King. In the final speech of his life, I have been to the mountaintop, he said, when it is dark enough, you can see the stars. When it is dark enough, you can see the stars. For me, for the National Committee, the darkness has given us a clarity of purpose. It has shown a bright light on what needs to be done. It has shown a bright light on the importance of our mission. As fiction takes hold, we focus on facts. As our governments tear down bridges, we build them. Our young leaders, our public intellectual, our student leaders, our participants in our Track 2 dialogues, participants in our foreign policy colloquium, our speakers and our hundreds of partners throughout the United States stand together in calling for deepening understanding. We stand together advocating policies that are fact and data-based. Since the last time we gathered here a year ago, we have run 150 programs. Our videos and podcasts have now been seen by an audience of well over one million. Next Monday, we will host our re-envisioned Chinatown Hall hosted by ABC's George Stephanopoulos. We have organized like-minded NGOs to counter the false narratives that are too often the foundation of flawed policies. Support for education about US-China relations is growing. And though it will not happen overnight, in the long term, understanding and education will prevail. We could not prevail. We could not accomplish what we do without the support of each and every person in this room. That support enables us to each and every day create cutting edge, cutting edge programs to counter this crisis in the relationship. So I am thrilled to announce tonight that we have raised more than $2.7 million for the National Committee. I want to thank Hank Greenberg and the Starr Foundation. We wouldn't be here 
without your support. I want to thank Ray Dalio and Bridgewater, tonight's honoree, for your extraordinary generosity. Our development team of, where are they, Jung, Nikki, and Noah have done a spectacular job this year. We have 12 donors at 100,000 and more this year. Finally, I want to thank each person in this room for their support. So let me close with the last lines of the Tang Dynasty, the Tang Dynasty's greatest poet, Li Bai, from his poem called Xing Lu Nan, in English appropriately called The Difficult Road. Chang Feng Po Lang Hui Yo Shi, Zhi Guai Yun Fan, Ji Tang Hai. which is beautifully translated. Someday, with my sail piercing the clouds, we will mount the wind, break the waves, and traverse this vast rolling sea. Because of your support, we will traverse this difficult role, road and strengthen the relationship that will determine the peace and prosperity of the 21st century. Thank you all for coming. Tonight, we have some special guests who've flown in from China. One of them is Qi Cholan, the dean of the China Jiangnan Weaving Research Institute. She came from Suzhou today to bring a very special gift for our honoree, the propitious lotus. Are we showing that on the screen? I can't see the screen. Is it there? Yes. The gift is a handmade recreation of a spectacular Ming Dynasty painting using the unique Su embroidery technique. Please welcome her to the stage and thank her for donating this wonderful gift. Yes, yes, yes. While our next speaker is known to every single person in this room as a Nobel Prize winner and our 56th Secretary of State, his association with the National Committee goes back to virtually our founding. During the days of ping pong diplomacy and the early years of the relationship, he very graciously met with all the groups we brought to the White House. In the years following, he regularly raised our program requests with Joanne Lai during his annual meetings with the Premier. He was the honoree at the National Committee's first gala in 1986, and he has spoken for us more times than we can count, and continues to do that tonight. It is my pleasure to welcome the National Committee's Executive Vice Chairman, Dr. Henry A. Kissinger. I will just say a few words tonight about the current state of Sino-American relations. When we started this relationship, it was a strategic relationship. Both the United States and China <clears throat> felt threatened by the Soviet Union. And we agreed to, cut, to work together in order to overcome this danger. From the beginning, there was a difference 
in our relationship with, with, we, with China, than with many other countries. It is not easy for Americans to work on a long-term relationship with China. We are very pragmatic. We deal with immediate problems. And we believe the solution of these problems will bring about a permanent stability. Chinese believe, in my estimation, that no problem ever gets finally solved, that every solution is an entry ticket to a new set of problems. And they therefore look at the evolution of a relationship rather than on its immediate uh, issues. Nevertheless, over the decades, we have learned to work with each other. And over the decades, a cooperative relationship has, has developed. Some people now make the argument that the Chinese promised us they would become Democrats in the American sense, or that we expected this. We, at the beginning of this process, thought we needed to concentrate on solving the issues that divided us and eventually the world. What is worrisome about the present situation is that we are aware of our problems, but on both sides there develops an attitude that we are dealing with an adversary rather than a potential partner. There is no doubt that many aspects of the evolution of China are challenging to aspects of America. And there is no doubt that the United States in its reactions and also in its own perceptions is not fully in accord with some of the measures China has taken. But we have to understand that between two great countries of a different history, such differences are inevitable. And the challenge of policy is to see whether we can develop enough of a common conviction about the future so that we can spare the world a conflict between two great societies. It has never happened before that major countries developed in different parts of the universe and were in a position to interact with each other. The Roman Empire knew very little about the Chinese Empire. And through most of history, the different 
regional entities developed autonomously. We live in a world now in which China has risen from the period of colonialism to becoming one of the great powers of the present world. And it's also a period where the first time in American history we have assumed responsibilities in peacetime for many regions and for many problems. And it's also a period where it is no longer possible to think that one side can dominate the other. So both countries used to being exceptional countries and used to being unique countries have to get used to the fact that they have a kind of a rival and that that competition is in a way permanent. Modern economics and modern technology link the world into one system. And when two great countries encounter each other in this manner, it is inevitable that on many issues, there may not be a complete agreement. But what is imperative is that both countries understand that a permanent conflict between them cannot be won and there will be a catastrophic outcome if it leads to permanent conflict. Anyone who studies the evolution of current technology knows that we are at the beginning of a period in which there are applications of technology which will change our very conception of the nature of reality and of the impact of science on human life. If China and the United States deal with that issue as a confrontation with the notion that one side can achieve a permanent victory over the other, the result will be worse than the world war wars that ruined European civilization. So for people like me and for people in this room, we know in our gut that we have a duty to work for a relationship with China in which both sides can talk frankly to the other about the dangers they see and about the opportunities that are before them. Both sides 
will be driven by reality to create centers of decision near their presidents in which the Sino-American dialogue can be conducted on a permanent basis. We cannot afford a policy of mutual reciprocal threats. And we have before us an obligation to develop some common conception of the evolution of the world. That will be a very difficult effort. And we will not necessarily agree at every stage. In fact, there are many issues on which we probably disagree. And then we have to learn to manage these disagreements. But we also need to seek opportunities and recognize opportunities where common efforts will advance us towards a world in which the transformation can occur on a peaceful and creative basis. So we should look at the present state of affairs as an inevitable transition. I expect that this trade agreement will be concluded in a positive way. But it should be only the first step of a Sino-American contribution to a world which will not be able to avoid analyzing the reality that it is at a historic turning point in which realities will be created that have not occurred in this magnitude probably ever, but certainly not for a long time. So I am confident and hopeful that we will overcome these present tensions. And in a way they were necessary as both sides looked at their immediate history and faced an as yet unknown future. In a few days, I'll be going to China and I'll be talking with Chinese leaders in this sense. And while I expect that there are many points of concern on their side as they are on ours, I hope and really expect that over the years to come, we will feel both sides obliged to move in the direction that I have sketched. And then this group, which came together as an article of faith decades ago, will continue to fulfill itself. And so we are in a difficult period now, but I am confident that the leaders on both sides will come to realize 
that the future of the world depends on their capacity to analyze together what the challenge is, to work out parallel solutions, and to manage the inevitable difficulties. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chair of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, Ambassador Carla Hills. Well, thank you so much. Good evening. Wonderful evening. Secretary Kissinger, ambassadors, diplomats, distinguished guests, and all, all our wonderful friends here tonight, it gives me great pleasure as chair to uh, extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you. I hope you enjoyed your dinner and your conversation at your table as much as I did. And I hope you enjoyed the magnificent singing of uh, Bing Bing Wong. You know? Yes. You know, she flew in from Shanghai this afternoon just to be with us. Amazing. So she deserves another hand of applause. <laughs> and this year represents the 40th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and China. And the gains in the intervening decades have been hugely beneficial to both our nations. Yet I don't have to tell anyone in this room that these are turbulent times, economically, politically, and technologically. And they are severely affecting our bilateral relations. Some commentators have suggested that the differences in our history, our forms of government, our domestic sensitivities are too great for us to sit down and find solutions to our current challenges. The notion is growing that we're in the process of decoupling. I disagree. I'm much more optimistic. I believe that we can and we must, in our own national interest, work together to ensure prosperity and peace. The fact that last month our negotiating teams took a small first step toward reaching an agreement is a good sign. And hopefully in the coming months we can build on that and achieve a, pos a positive outcome of a range of issues that have divided us. But the work of the National Committee is dedicated to building mutual understanding between the United States and China, which has never, never been as important. We need to encourage discussion and understanding at all levels. And our exchange programs and our track two dialogues make a real difference. We could not make the contributions that we do without everyone in this room and the support that you give us. It really, really matters. We're thrilled tonight to have with us both of our, well, actually, we only have one of with us of our executive vice president, Secretary Kissinger, whom you've already heard from and gave a magnificent speech. <laughs> As Secretary of State and our National Security Advisor, he played the key role in normalizing the bilateral relationship. Hank Greenberg, a highly respected business executive, and I can tell you, none have done more than he in supporting the work of the National Committee. And so we thank both of them one in person 
and one in absentia for their contributions. And Henry, thank you for being with us tonight. I also want to uh, express my enormous gratitude to Ray Dalio, our extraordinary honoree who helped uh, succeed our fundraising goal, uh, goal for the gala tonight. Uh, and our chair level donors are really important. BlackRock, Building and Land Technology, Chubb, Citadel Securities, General Atlantic, Perfect World, Sanofi, the Star Foundation, Tishman Spire, Exco Energy and Resources, Akako Yamasaki, and Jerry Young. I apologize for that. I thank each and every one of you for your leadership and your willingness to step forward in these challenging times involving our U.S.-China relations. And also, I want to express my thanks to the other sponsors and members of our gala committee who are listed in our program and deserve a lot of our appreciation. Last but not least, I want to express personally my enormous uh, uh, appreciation uh, for our people who run this organization, our outstanding president, Steve Orleans, a remarkable, <laughs> our remarkable Vice President, Jan Barris, <laughs> our dedicated National Committee staff who have labored, I can tell you, night and day to further the mission of this splendid organization. And without them, 26, we would not make the deep impression that we make. So we now come to the awards portion of our program, and I'm pleased to invite to the podium our National Committee Vice Chairman, Evan Greenberg, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Chubb. And he will present this year's award to Ray Dalio, the founder, chief, ch co-chief investment officer, and co-chairman of Bridgewater Associates, who will share with us his views. Evan, you are welcome. Good evening, everybody. All of you know Ray Dalio as one of the most accomplished investors of our time, and his firm Bridgewater Associates as the largest and most successful hedge fund in the world. What you may not know about Ray is three decades of personal, business, and philanthropic experience in China. His knowledge, affection, and respect for the Chinese culture and people have led to a real understanding of China and many deep and intimate friendships. Ray's relationship with China has been a family affair that began 35 years ago when Ray was invited to teach economics and financial markets. He went out of curiosity and brought his family along. They were immediately struck by the people they met and who cared for them, their warmth and their kindness. They found a country underdeveloped economically, but a culture highly advanced. Over the years, Ray came back again and again, supporting China's leadership as they began building their financial system. In fact, he helped to establish their first stock exchange. Ray's family came back as well. They immersed themselves in Chinese culture and education. Ray's son attended local Chinese schools. The family formed a deep affection for the people, coupled with a natural desire to support them. When he was a teenager, 
Ray's son visited a local orphanage, and finding it filled with physically handicapped children, he learned that many could be healed for as little as $500. He took it upon himself to raise 70,000 back home. Since then, the Dalio family has raised many millions to help special needs orphans in China. Today, Bridgewater manages investments and provides advice to the country's leading institutions and senior policymakers. The good work of Ray and his family's philanthropic activities were provided through the China Care Foundation, the Beijing Dalio Foundation, and the China Global Philanthropy Institute. Ray's personal journey with China and the many trusted relationships he has built with senior leadership have made a contribution towards improving the knowledge and understanding between the Chinese and American people, a contribution that aligns closely with the mission of the National Committee. As you all know, our country's relationship today with China is marked by deep strategic distrust and a lack of meaningful high-level communication. Both countries have constituents that view the other as a threat or even as an enemy and advocate, f advocate for, the, for disengagement. These notions are growing in popularity and, in my judgment, are misguided and take us in the wrong direction. With the People's Republic of China recently recognizing its 70th anniversary, our two nations shared history in many important respects would suggest otherwise. Cooperation and engagement have benefited both our nations. The U.S. business community wants engagement, not decoupling. We seek cooperation and healthy competition while we each defend our respective national interests. We want negotiations that lead to substantive agreement and outcomes, not tariffs. We don't support a trade war as a strategy. We want to compete, but insist we do so on a level playing field. With that, I am delighted to present the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations 2019 Gala Honoree, Ray Dalio. Thank you so much, Evan. Um, I'm so cr incredibly in awe of the people who are in this room. You know, some have been mentioned, uh, Dr. Kissinger, Carla Hills, Steve Orleans, um, but there are many, 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 many more, so I'm very humbled to be here. and. The way I think of, we, we each have perspectives, uh, but it's, it's a little bit like the parable of the blind man and the elephant. You know, um, we each touch a little bit of our, of China, and we all have opinions, uh, maybe too many opinions, uh, and there's a lot of argument about what the right opinions are, and I can't say what the right opinions are. I can only share the perspective that I've acquired, and so whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but it's been my perspective. As Evan said, uh, when I, when I, I was lucky enough to go to China in, in, in 1984, so 35 years ago, as a guest of uh, CIDIC, which was uh, the only window company at the time. That was the only company that could look at the outside world and deal with the outside world. And I, you know, at that time, I would bring, um, as a gift, $10 calculators to 
people who ran companies, and they thought they were miraculous machines. And I remember sitting, uh, giving a, a lecture to teach them about the financial markets on the 10th floor of the chocolate building, and to look out on the chocolate building, and there were all the hutongs that were down there, and then to imagine what China would be like, because China was opening up, you know, and I could see that the this is not a developed country. This is not an underdeveloped country. I've been to many other developed countries, but it was a highly civilized, intelligent, and warm country that had the, the potential. So I could see that the world was here in cost, and, this, and China was here, and there was going to be an opening up, and the world would change as a result of that opening up. So I looked out on the hutongs, and when I looked at the hutongs and said, this is going to change, you know, they said, you don't know China. And I said, okay, I don't know. But uh, there's globalization, and who knows what would happen. And since then, China's uh, income levels have increased by 26 times. Its share of world GDP went from 2 percent to 22 percent. Um, its poverty rate went from over 88 percent to less than 1 percent. Its life expectancy increased by 10 years. There's no greater miracle than has happened in China. And I've been uh, in the fortunate position to know the Chinese people and from all levels, as Evan described, I, uh, through my son's eyes, and, and he taught me really about philanthropy, so through my son's eyes, um, I um, was in the orphanage system. And so I met people there. I, I met his teachers at school. Um, I met uh, people who were here, uh, Securities Exchange Executive Council, Wang Bu Ming, uh, Wang Jun, um, Jesse, Jesse Wang, um, Wang uh, Li, um, Gao Xi Ching, many people who have become 30-year type of friendships. And then I was able to see things. And so I can only describe what it is through my eyes. It's, to me, um, the perspectives are different. And one of the leaders described to me that the essence of that difference is that in the United States, the United States is a country of individuals and individualism, and it treasures the individual. It treasures the revolutionary individual, the Steve Jobs type of personality who will disrupt the system and so on. And in China, um, it is the family, and as an extension of the family, the collective. And he described that the word country consists of two words, two, two characters, which is state, family, and that there's a top-down system, and there are different core values. There's much in, that's the same, but there is also a different perspective. And that perspective then gets reflected in some of the differences in the conflicts that we see, such as maybe the NFL conflict and so on. Um, the issue is the ability to see things through each other's eyes. I've been very lucky to be uh, dealing with particularly economic policymakers so that I could see things through their eyes. And of course, economics has also shifted to geopolitics. And by being able to see things through their eyes, I would say that by and large, um, I would be doing the same sort of economic policies that they've done. And that if I was to look for the, uh, the long term in terms of productivity and the like, and the things that are happening in the way of innovation, that entrepreneurship, creativity, capitalism in China, and these types of things, the reforms. But we're going through a particular period of time, too, where there was uh, a debt adjustment and how to manage that. Sometimes it seems that, a, that when you do healthy things in, in constraining the debt, that it is a lot less fun and a lot more painful than when you have a great time getting into debt. So there are these types of adjustments that are, that, that are being made. And um, so as I look at this, my responsibility is a, um, an economic investor, a global economic investor, is to try to find what are the elements that make countries succeed and fail, and to do that over time. 
And that's led me to develop indicators and literally quantify those indicators into leading economic indicators for the well-being. In my study of watching uh, why reserve currencies and the countries behind them have risen and declined, with the help of my fabulous research team, uh, we've been able to look through times. Those are arcs. Those are long arcs. In other words, um, let's, the, there's the U.S. as the existing r world's reserve currency. Before that, there was the British Empire. Before that, there was the Dutch Empire. And these things take place over long periods of time, 100, 200 years. Many of those we can't see, but yet they take us by surprise, like the change in the reserve currency. And the factors that we see over a period of time um, in terms of the indicators that we put together are, I'll describe it in, in, in brief. Indicators first of education and civility. The better the education and the more the civility of the behavior of people together. Infrastructure. Infrastructure is a good leading indicator. And then technology, the invention of new technologies. Technology is a, not only a commercial asset, it is a military asset. The capacity to build technology is a leading indicator. For example, you know, when the Dutch invented ships that can go all around the world and they carried guns, uh, because in Europe they fought a lot, then they were able to account for half of world trade, Holland, because of the importance of technology. Then you get improvements in output, GDP rises, and then you have larger and larger shares of world trade. It's a reflection of the competitiveness of how that arises over a period of time, because you grow because you're competitive and you raise those living standards. And as you go globally, it's the development of the military because you need the military to both protect your trade routes and also to protect um, the, the natural resources. And then with that, there's always the development of a financial system, a financial hub. You know, in, in, in the Dutch Empire, it was Amsterdam. Then it was London. Then it was New York. And increasingly, it will be Shanghai. And this is an evolution. And with that, there's the development of a reserve currency because it is the medium by which um, there is a common currency and a common exchange rate. And when that exists, it also means that those countries can get deeper into debt because everyone wants to save in the currency and you set their, you're lent that currency and then they get deeper in debt and the economies get overextended. And that is sort of the history of the rise and declines of empires and there's a certain destiny that happens as a result of that. And I want to share with you just a couple of slides. <clears throat> um, we, we, thanks to this wonderful research team over there, um, uh, we, 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 this group digs through archives of statistics over, uh, over um, long periods of time so that we can develop indicators of each of those things, of, of education, um, infrastructure, technology, output, and world trade. I wish I had the time to show you them all, but I, wanted, I, I, I want to convey to you that this first chart, which I can't see all that well from up here, but what it does is it shows um, these indicators applied to all the major empires starting around 1500. So you could see the rises and declines of each of those empires. This is the average of these indicators. And I think it, it helps to give me perspective, and I, and, I, and I hope it gives perspective, because you can see that red line is the red line of China. And what you see is not only rising at a strong pace, but you also see where China was in the relative importance throughout history. China was, for most of its history, the most important or one of the most important empires in the world. Far ahead of, the United, the, the, of Europe, there was no United States. Far ahead of, of Europe in, in inventing the printing press 500 years ahead and so on. And it is because of an approach. It is not our, an American approach. It's not democracy, it's not, uh, but it is an approach. It's their approach, a, a Confucian approach. It has to do with the way that they're operating. And so there are things that make Americans American and there are things that make Chinese Chinese. And we can't 
ever expect that we're going to make the Chinese like Americans and to adopt our system or to make or any more than they should expect that Americans should be made like Chinese. And so as we have that type of competition, I'll, I'll take you back just, we, we took it back to the Tang Dynasty in China. So if you show the next slide, or maybe I'll hit this. That's what I'm supposed to do. Oh, I blew it. Uh, okay, no. There we go, Tang Dynasty, uh, and so on. Wow. So there's a tremendous culture and a tremendous capability in history that has to do with what, what they exist. And so it is with great admiration, I have great admiration for the Chinese, a different system. And with that, um, there are wars. We use, I, I don't like the word war rather than negotiations. But there is, you know, there's a trade war. There's a technology war. There is a geopolitical war. And there could be capital wars. And that is the nature of the environment. And how that's approached is going to determine what our futures are like. And I honestly don't know how, we'll, how it will be approached. We want to be optimistic. But as uh, Graham Allison, who was here tonight, described in his Thucydides trap de description, there's a certain destiny to, the, to arguing about those things and not a global world legal system that gets us through those things. So when I look at it, I think that I, I hope that it is done with mutual understanding, that it is uh, that instead of wars, which mean lose-lose relationships, that we approach this with win-win relationships by seeing each other through each other's eyes and not expecting the others to be like us in all respects at which we evolve through time. So anyway, I'm done. Thank you very much for this great honor. I appreciate it very much. Well, that was terrific, Ray, and I want to thank you publicly for uh, all you've done this evening to make this great. And Evan Greenberg, thank you so much. You brought the evening to a wonderful close. And uh, I also want to express my thanks to Shi Sholan for her wonderful artwork and uh, Tiffany and company for the award.